Um, but uh, it's a pleasure to take over from um, the previous session and to go for the last session, starting maybe with some introductory and welcoming words from Stefan Ketz, Executive Director of CESAR Europe, that is extremely proud to collaborate with CESAR Ukraine and Globescan. And then also Hans Dance as Chair of the Board will take uh, a few seconds also for his address. Stefan? Yeah, thank you, Jan, and welcome to all of you for this final session of what has been an extraordinary 24-hour webathon. And what I pick up from also my colleagues who attended more sessions than I did, that this unique event gave an opportunity to share grief, to share sadness and feelings of powerlessness. And it was a place to seek support on how to act in times of desperation that we all know. And the webinars, what they demonstrated was the way to engage and share learnings on how to engage. And in the first place, then I think of my colleague Marina from CSR Ukraine. Eh? Marina, you are an example for us. Eh? Because, eh, and that is a CSR Europe thing, true leadership comes with engagement, we always say. You need to go local and do the things. But true leadership, through you, I learned, comes with perseverance in engagement. Engagement as such is not enough, but perseverance and engagement. So for that lesson already, thank you and thank you for your colleagues as well. And because you need that perseverance and sometimes, especially in Western Europe, we tend to give up maybe too quick or to be complacent too quick. So thank you for that. This morning we had our General Assembly here at CSR Europe and the com we elected a new board and the, common main and the common message of all these new board members was about engagement to be a do tank, make Europe relevant for people. And Europe is wider than the European Union. Eh? It's make keep Europe relevant for people, make the S and the focus of the S the social, but do it locally and get engaged in your supply chain, in your value chain, with your employees, with the families of your employees. That was the big message. And I think that resonated well what you have been talking about in this webinar. So thank you, Marina. Thank you, Chris Coulter for, and the Globescan team for working. And thank you to Hannah and Georgia from our team on uh, supporting this work. It's very important. We live in a different world. And Chris always uses this. I always have to think about it, but later he will tell me again what it is, VUCA thing. It's something about uncertainty and volatile. Well, that is this. And it's, at this stage, maybe Ukrainian people who are suffering from that most. But as climate change teaches us that emissions and environmental sustainability needs to be needed to be taken seriously, let's at least make sure, at least, and it doesn't compensate anything at all, let's at least make sure that the war teaches us to take people and democracy and human rights very seriously. And companies have a big role to play in all of those elements, in the care towards the people, in the safeguarding of democracy, and in the respect and in the realization of human rights also, although and in the previous session it was a lot about that. Uh, the lady from GRI Latam was, was talking very intelligently about this. It's about creating local impact. That's the work related to due diligence. So it's urgent, it's needed, and it requires collaboration, not in words, but in very practical action. That's what we are trying to do. That's what we try to do with the network of national partners with CSR Europe, and we should further improve on that. Uh, and, and there's a strong will to do that. But without further ado, I will give the floor uh, after this thank you to Hans Dams, who was until Still today now, although a new board is selected, the chair of the board of CSR Europe and a leader in the space of the work we do. So, Hans, the floor is yours. And thank you all for being here. Thank you, Stefan. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's no scoop when I say that the world in which we are living and operating is undergoing very fundamental change. Building a sustainable business has become more complicated than ever before in a complex political, economic, and competitive landscape. Companies and their leaders now need to find the right balance between the sometimes competing and exclusive trends of this new complex world. And in response to this new re reality, sustainability as the way 
to future-proof business have become increasingly the only way forward. And in order for organizations to become successful, they will need to proactively engage with their stakeholders on their material issues. And this is exactly where CSR Europe comes in. With our focus on Europe green and social, we are very much aligned with the EU strategic direction for the future. And CSR Europe helps transform businesses and integrate sustainability whilst putting the focus on the S and the challenges for employability, equality and social inclusion. Um, the shockwaves of the invasion of Ukraine by Russia are reaching more and more countries and sectors. And the war brought with it a flow of refugees that is unprecedented since the Second World War. On top of the horrible human consequences full of grief and anxiety, there's also the massive negative impact on the world economy of the war in Ukraine with significant risks of destabilization in many regions and countries. And neither should we forget the difficulties faced by many emerging and developing countries, particularly when it comes to food security. So how do we go from here? And I believe that four directions are essential. One, respect for human rights and the rule of law. Two, inclusion and diversity. Three, a just transition to leave no one behind. And four, a genuine approach of caring for people also by companies. I'm incredibly encouraged by many examples of what the member of companies of CSI Europe and its national partners are doing. But um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to highlight some of the amazing work that companies in Ukraine are doing based on stakeholder engagement. So the mobile operators, Kiev Star, Vodafone and LifeCell have joined forces to launch national roaming which actually means uninterrupted communication of their subscribers. If one operator's connection is lost, the subscriber will be able to manually connect to the connection of another operator. Spivdia, apologies for my poor uh, uh, pronunciation, but coaction, one of the NGOs for donation receivers is a platform that brings together in Ukraine volunteer and state initiatives to provide humanitarian aid in times of war. It was great to see all the youth voices before because they need 23 youth hubs all over Ukraine where people in need can get the necessary humanitarian help. Up to now, they helped already 112,000 people. So let me conclude by thanking, and words are difficult to find, but the teams at Globescan, CSI Ukraine and CSI Europe all your efforts in setting up this and running up this quite extraordinary event. So thank you for attention and your support and let's make it the most useful of the 24 hours. Hans, thank you so much. And Chris, you're welcome. After the welcome of yesterday, when we were kicking off this 24 hours webathon, you're welcome for this last session, Chris. Thanks so much, Jan. And yes, um, the last session, 24 hours, and it has been, uh, I've, I had a few hours sleep, but I, I, I did absorb a remarkable um, set of conversations and panels, and, and, I, and I am still uh, overwhelmed by the generosity of, of the 90 speakers um, coming together in a very short period of time, um, and really wonderful partnership with you, Jan, and Stefan, and Hannah, and CSR Europe, and and Marina, of course, all the work you've been doing, and 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 it's important to recognize the <clears throat> the smoothness of this entire event. The logistics were all done by um, Marina's uh, team in Ukraine, and um, it, through under a remarkable duress, they pulled off this 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 beautiful um, event. So thank you, everybody. But Stefan said VUCA, and it's <laughs> let, let's just translate what that is. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the V is volatile, the U is uncertain, the C is complex, and the A is ambiguous. And this is an old military term that sort of described a chaotic environment. And it's been it's been used by, I think, sustainability people increasingly. And, and yesterday in, in a session, someone referenced VUCA 2.0. And, and as Kissinger said, the world is completely different now than it was before the Russians invaded Ukraine. 
Uh, and I think that is absolutely true when it comes to sustainability. I think all of us have been feeling the, the increasing tension and the inflection point that we're at now, which is um, extraordinary and, and a moment for us to pause, which is why this 24 hours, I think, has been very useful, not only to support our brothers and sisters working on the ground in Ukraine, but also to try and come together and de decipher these trends and the collision of things that are happening so we can go forward and be much more um, effective. And we know the challenges are, are, in, are uh, intense and intensifying. We've got over 420 parts per million of carbon dioxide in, in the atmosphere, which is an extraordinary amount for us to absorb and for our natural mm. systems to absorb. We are um, at the point of 1.5 degrees being unachievable because of our continued approach to, to the net zero conversation. We're in the midst of a sixth mass extinction wave when it comes to biodiversity and nature. Um, which uh, is also um, an existential threat to all of us and to all living beings on the planet. We have gone through and are still reconciling with this, this terrible pandemic um, and, and potentially um, it coming back in certain ways and, and all, of the, all of the implications and pain that's caused. We have, that has forced us into a deeper sense of poverty and polarization and inequality across the world, which is driving polarization and difficulty in governance and anger and fear in many parts of the populations across the world. And we have this death rattle um, of uh, fascism um, from the Russian regime, which has also been seeping into all parts of society across the world that we have to reconcile with. And, and, and this collision between the growing expectations from the work that we do at GlobeScan of the population being concerned about not only the pandemic, but yes, about climate change and about nature and about health and well-being and about poverty. It's an extraordinary growth and concern across people from all parts of the world. And stakeholders um, signaling in our ongoing tracking of stakeholder perceptions of an urgency that's even um, higher than it has been in the last 30 years of our tracking. And so we're at this moment of expectations rising and people understanding intuitively and rationally that we're at the cusp of something uh, very dire if we don't shift our, our approaches. And we also have a critical mass of all of us in the sustainability community that have grown and are flourishing and are doing more work and more attention with more sophistication to address the systemic changes that are required. Um, and, and at the very last piece of it, there is this counter reaction that we're seeing that, again, I think is at the core an irrational um, need for control and order and for parts of the economy um, that are kleptocratic, <laughs> that are oligarchic, that are have vested interests in, in the old world that are manifesting itself into a fascist um, mentality. And, and I think that's what it is. And that's what we're confronting. Um, so what we need to do, and is what John Elkington referenced yesterday, is we all collectively have to have a, heart, a harder and a sharper edge in driving forward the sustainable development mindset to understand this is the only path forward for humanity and for all living creatures on the planet. And as um, John said, they had in a workshop where the, the, the slogan was step up or get out of the way. And I think that level of conviction and determination that we see in the Ukrainians in, in driving forward is exactly what we have to adopt. That same level of, of determination with dignity and with principles, but, but clearly um, with their backs against the wall and fighting for the future that we all want. Because the SDGs are off track we need to, we all agreed six years ago to commit to these wonderful goals and, and we're not gonna make them. But we, we have some green shoots that are important to embrace and understand. First of all, our science is clearer and stronger and better. We understand exactly where we are and what needs to happen, which is a, a real gift. So we understand how to calibrate what has to move and how quickly we have to move. We have capital markets engaged for the first time in 40 years of sustainable development conversations. <clears throat> Not perfect. There are flaws in the ESG mm -hmm. um, paradigm, but we're moving in that direction where we can mobilize trillions of dollars in, in in positive directions and investing in this new economy. We have a nature agenda, which has been obvious to, <laughs> to many people, but now it's also having this holistic integrative approach to climate and biodiversity and water and land use, which are the fundamentals of all living uh, systems going forward. And we have this conversation, which 
uh, Stefan also referenced and, and Hans did too on the just transition. How do we do this inclusively? How do we bring people along? How do we leave no one behind with that compassion and caring that is so so fundamental. And finally, I think we've also woken up to the, the G and ESG at a macro level where governance requires us to think of liberal democratic principles and traditions as the way to achieve things like the SDGs because with 4 billion people living on authoritarianism today, it's not the ideal system for us to get to where we need to get to. And we need to confront that. We need to work hard at that and understand what, how, the, how regulatory and governance systems affect the sustainability agenda going forward. So that brings us to a regenerative era where we do need business and large business in particular because of their depth of supply chains, their, their deep penetration into all facets of the economy, their long and, and significant direct and indirect employment of hundreds of thousands of people. We need to be able to have those companies in particular not just get to zero, but to get to a, a positive footing to catch up um, as, as the clock of climate in particular ticks relentlessly and unceasingly. So regeneration means, I think, net zero, yes, but also net positive. And, and, and Paul Pullman's book with Andrew Winston is, is, is um, a, a fantastic guiding light for us to see how do we not only get to some sort of neutral footing, but how do we build and more flourishing environmental ecosystems and have broader multiples of contributions on the social side. We also need new systems and new systems change. And, and um, Sally Uren from Forum for the Future yesterday referenced this, this sense that systems aren't broken. They, they actually work because we've designed them to work in certain ways which have negative, unintended, and sometimes intended consequences. So we have to develop new systems and figure that out. And the leadership that, that is required comes from a conversation I heard yesterday that Raphael Bamparad from BBMG spoke to a, a young woman from Extinction Rebellion, where they were talking about the new leadership needs to embrace uncertainty and embrace the not knowing. And in that not knowing, there's a, a sense of curiosity that leads to different networks, different conversations, different innovation cycles. And that's where we find the new different and better approaches systemically. Um, all of this is also predicated on the fact that we have a decade of action that we're deep into, we're halfway through the SDG uh, journey. And we also have, I think, a catalytic sense of activism from citizens on the ground, from shareholders, from employees, from civil society, from governmental actors, from corporate actors, inside companies trying to drive towards what they know is in their long-term interest of the business. And we've got to fight that short-termism. So we have a decade of activism combined with a decade of activism and, and action and activism. And this, I think, will catalyze us uh, to that newer and better time. And, and in any paradigm shift, there is always disruption, challenges, highs and lows. And while we may be in one of those little lulls right now, I think the, the last 24 hours and all the wonderful people who have come together with all of their experience and wisdom, experience and, and, and power looking to drive that change even further. Um, so I'm heartened by it. And, and uh, thank you very much for everyone attending and, and back to you, Jan. Thank you, Chris. And if you would not have stopped now, I would have stopped you only because I see the difference in the tone of your voice. You are losing your voice. So it's really a testimony of how you have been surviving these 24 hours without much sleeping. So please also recover um, uh, very soon. It's my pleasure to introduce you um, the panelists for a session that will focus on just uh, transition and um, maybe some other words to express just transition, do we have um, the right battle plans for leaving no one behind? Uh, this 24 hours was very much about not leaving uh, Ukraine behind. Uh, we all recognize ourselves. Kiev is almost the capital of Europe. That is what I have learned yesterday. Um, the people that will intervene uh, are the following. We have Audrey Parizel from the European Committee of the Regions. We have Elisa Rota from Fondazione Sodalitas. It's our national network on corporate sustainability and responsibility in Italy. Christian Lesmeister from LKQ Europe. Much uh, welcomed, uh, Christian. And Wilfried Heemans from 
BNP Paribas. Um, before we enter the conversation, just a quick context setting. Um, uh, just transition is what uh, has been chosen by the board of CISA Europe a few months ago to be the USP of CSR Europe. It's also um, an answer that we are giving to many, many, many calls, not only the people that you see on the screen, calling for urgent action and collaboration for a more fair, just uh, transition to really emphasize the S of ESG, climate is a social agenda. Um, so that was uh, answering the call of many, many leaders. There were also uh, leaders from civil society, from trade unions, uh, from the UN Rapporteur on Human Rights and Poverty. Um, there was really a, a critical mass of uh, calls last year at the uh, CISA Europe Summit on SDGs. And um, what you can see is that CISA Europe is uh, having a strong uh, leaders hub with uh, companies and very soon CEOs coming together. But uh, the good news is that uh, there are also other leadership initiative. It's the Business Commission tackling inequalities uh, under the wing of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. You also see the OECD that launched two years ago or a little bit more, the initiative on business for inclusive growth. Uh, and we are starting to link with one another also together with the European Commission um, that has uh, adopted uh, just a few days ago a kind of European doctrine on just transition. It is a roadmap uh, adopted by the Council uh, on the 16th of June, setting strategic direction for policies, strategies, investments, and initiatives by the 27 governments. Um, you see, of course, also the CISA Europe network of national networks, which is a huge asset that we have as well um, to think just transition, not just in the capitals or in conferences or in webinars, but when it is about going territorial and local. Um, the companies now that are acting in this leaders hub are developing um, a business roadmap for businesses and also together with a toolbox on just transition and they are trying to bring a, a structure i take the words from toyota that was speaking this morning about this initiative this hub through the roadmap is bringing structure on how companies can enhance and upgrade their governance their strategy their policies especially with regard building more inclusive workplaces. There are still too many employees that fall out of a number of offers. Is it on the upskilling or reskilling agenda? It is also about how do you invest far more strategically in your communities and in your supply chains. In the communities, we know we are in different countries here already in a war of talents, but we are wasting talents uh, that are in our communities because we don't know as companies how to really strategically engage. And it is also about um, looking at how can you innovate your products and services so that they can suit uh, customers that are in vulnerable situations but that, can, but that cannot afford or access your classic products and services. And of course, there is a horizontal um, pillar in the whole work that we are currently doing, which is how do you support uh, this financially? So the sustainable finance is um, a very strong uh, element to make this possible. And I guess that um, Wilfried will, of course, highlight that in uh, his intervention. There will be also um, a European barometer that will be produced uh, as a kind of introduction to the roadmap, which is a set of the situation by Moody's looking at the social performance of companies in Europe. Um, so that is all there to be expected uh, officially at uh, in October at the European SDG Summit. I told already that this business roadmap that we are building with a toolbox uh, is there not to stay in the cupboards, um, but to land locally. Uh, that's why we are currently discussing with the European Commission and with the companies and other organizations that you see there, uh, a wider uh, European alliance of business for just transition that goes 
at national, local, territorial level. Um, if we go to, I think, the very last slide, I think it's important to also show how policy leadership and business leadership can uh, uh, shoulder, can join their efforts. So we are pleased to say that Commission is willing to co-host this initiative. They will be also co-hosting a meeting with CEOs in September that will discuss this roadmap and toolbox that will be that will be then finalized to make it public for the summit in October. And most important, we are looking for how to build this alliance to go local, to empower uh, business directors, uh, managers um, with this agenda on just transition. Also, we are looking for where locally to choose places where urgent uh, partnership is needed. Is it sectorial or cross-sectoral partnerships? I will not go further uh, of that, but this is a context to explain how CISA Europe is willing to uh, play its role uh, on this agenda. If I come back to the panelists, I would like to introduce Audrey. I mentioned Audrey that just transition, if it will not be territorial or local, well, then it will not be. So we are very pleased to have you, Audrey. You are from the European Committee of the Regions. And I'm very pleased personally also to introduce yourself because we have been working like hell a few years ago, CISA Europe, the Committee of the Regions, but together with the social platform, also the network of NGOs on development to co-write on behalf of 30 leaders of civil society, a plan that we provided to European governments, European Commission, European Parliament about how we saw a solid integrated strategy for Europe on sustainability, which then became the Green Deal, and where many elements have been taken from what we have been working on for a couple of years, um, uh, even before the Green Deal was um, announced. So a, a great pleasure to have you, and I know how much you have also been uh, a key person to drive sustainability in the Committee of the Regions. Audrey, how is this resonating um, within the Committee of the Regions? What is your strategy to make just transition a local reality? Audrey, and maybe you are muted. Uh, no. Oh, okay, see. Ah, okay, 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 that's good. Please. Thank you, thank you very much, Jan. And uh, I would like to to first uh, say how inspiring uh, these uh, these speeches have been. Uh, thanks a lot, and uh, we have been working a few years with the CSR Europe to to really push uh, uh, forward the SDGs agenda in in Brussels and. Uh, um, I'm very happy about the results and uh, I'm looking forward for, for the next steps and uh, uh, how this resonates uh, for me uh, as a representative of the European Committee of the Regions, uh, uh, just fair transition to, to go local. I need to give you a little bit of uh, context first is that the European uh, Committee of the Region is, um, is a new institution, it's an official uh, EU body, and it gathers uh, uh, mayors, uh, region governance, local and regional uh, uh, councillors to, to really get the, um, the territorial feeling in Brussels uh, uh, to advise uh, the EU decision maker on how it's going at, uh, at local level and what is expected, what is what is needed. And this is really the, the heart of our work that uh, Brussels doesn't lose sight of, uh, of, of the ground. And um, on SDGs, it's very important on sustainability because uh, what I noticed uh, as an EU civil servant is that uh, regions and cities are all always more ambitious on SDGs than a national and European level. So they have a triggering effect. They, they do things on the ground because they have to face directly the, the environmental, economic, social consequences of 
uh, uh, climatic uh, disaster, of the pandemic, of the Ukraine war, because they, they are uh, the first in contact with local communities and, uh, and businesses, and they have to react. They, they, they cannot just shut the door. And um, they, they, they do things and they say, look, you thought it was not possible, but it is possible. And now you can do it and you can do it at your scale at national and European uh, level. So they have this, um, this um, easy, um, uh, they, they can do it at a smaller scale, so it's a little bit easier, and, but they can prove uh, it's feasible, and then they can go higher, and, and, and they do it with their local stakeholders and, and communities, and that's why their, their role and their achievements in SDGs are, are quite big, and the, the OECD had a look at it, and actually they estimated that 65% of SDGs cannot be achieved without the inclusion or uh, coordination with uh, local and regional um, authorities. So it's, uh, it's quite big. And uh, we started to work with the OECD uh, uh, on these points. Uh, and uh, we made two surveys, uh, one survey two years ago and one survey during the pandemic. And uh, we saw that um, the enthusiasm, the commitment of regions and cities on sustainability, on SDGs, or Green Deal, name it how you want, on uh, just transition is still here and as, uh, is, is all the more stronger, you know, uh, because uh, for them, it's um, uh, the pandemic is not a, a reason to turn your back on SDGs. It shows you that if you had uh, implemented the SDGs before, you would not maybe have a, a pandemic. And uh, with the discussion uh, these days, now that uh, uh, there is a U Ukrainian uh, very unfortunate uh, uh, development and, and war, uh, it is the same narrative. It is, it is not time to undo our work on sustainability. It is time to accelerate it. It is the reason to, to, to do more, to, to, to better link uh, recovery and SDGs. And if if you look at um, uh, national uh, recovery plans, it's difficult to sense uh, the SDG link. But if you look uh, at uh, regions and cities uh, recovery plans, they are much more uh, SDGs and sustainability are much more integrated in these plans because for them, uh, recovery must be sustainable. And what is sustainable? It, the SDGs. And uh, what I, I want you to, to know is that they are really doing it. There is this process localizing SDGs. So it's making them a reality on the ground and they are, uh, they are, it's a virtuous cycle. Uh, they are more visible on SDG. So there are more support program to help uh, regions and cities from the OECD, from the EU, from research centers, etc., etc. They are fully committed to, to sustainability and they are, guess what, your best ally to help you on sustainability. Because what regions and cities want with all their power in, ed in education, environment, mobility, economic ecosystem, um, university, infrastructure, uh, and companies, inc incubators, dig digitalizations, they want their uh, local communities and businesses to thrive. This is what, what they need uh, for the territory to be harmonious. And um, that's why they, they are a, a good link for you uh, to, to help you navigate uh, towards, uh, towards the SDG and sustainability. And, and I can give you uh, just one small example of, uh, of what we do. Uh, Concretely, uh, we are discussing with the European Bank of um, Investment to do uh, um, a seminar on financing SDG uh, localization. Sorry. Uh, it means that uh, they will explain to cities and regions how to access their fund to finance uh, SDGs implementation. And the, the, the European Bank of Investment is 60 billion euros per year. Uh, they want to become the climate bank, the, the sustainability bank, and it is important that regions and cities get their hand on this as well, because then they can ventilate to a, a whole territory 
uh, to rural areas, to villages. And the, in the, at the end of the day, it's to create the right environment for you, for the right ecosystem for you to be more sustainable, to, for you to be able to accelerate uh, your work on sustainability uh, and to ensure your, your future. So if, um, if I want uh, to, to have uh, three key messages, in addition to all the work that we do with CSR Europe, uh, with other SDG stakeholders to really push SDGs in the Brussels agenda, uh, and also to all EU member states, we do uh, uh, more because regions and cities on the ground, they are here for you. So go knock on the door because they are really committed to sustainability. They are uh, usually more ambitious than the national and uh, European level. They are your ally. They want you to, to thrive and they, they can really help you navigate uh, this, um, this scary path. But uh, all the speeches before showed us that there is uh, hope, inspired people and uh, a lot of motivation to to make uh, this better and to get out of this uh, more sustainable. Thank you, Yann. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you very much for this. And I think we will have to follow your example and see also with the EIB, which is partnering with us on, on a number of activities, um, how we can also land locally with our ambition on just transition and see how in our toolbox, we also can have the right connections to how to access uh, regions, but also how to access EIB uh, available funds. Thank you for that, Audrey. I think the message was very clear and uh, we cannot miss uh, this link with this local and regional authorities, for sure. Um, I would like to maybe invite uh, first Christian and then Wilfried to take the floor. Christian from LKQ. Um, and what I learned already from you uh, and what your company is doing, Christian, is that technology and innovation are also, also a very strong ally to accelerate uh, the innovation towards more fair um, and inclusive activities of business. Can you maybe first take the floor, Christian? Absolutely. Thank you, Jan. And um, thank you for this great opportunity to share our approach on an inclusive and just transition. As Jan had mentioned earlier, we are um, a member of CSR Europe and we are very proud that we are engaging and we are able to engage in the CSR Europe Leaders Hub. And um, we are the first um, member in the segment and we represent the independent automotive aftermarket. And um, I want to quickly introduce to you LKQ, what we do, who we are, because we might not be very familiar with you. Um, we are a leading distributor of automotive aftermarket parts. So parts that are used for cars, commercial vans and industrial vehicles. And our parent company, LKQ Corporation, they come from the recycling. So with our salvage and vehicle operations, we recycle more than 90% of the materials from an end of life vehicle. And as Jan has mentioned, we are, of course, investigating always business opportunities that are profitable and at the same time sustainable. So supporting through our innovation, also sustainable growth for all our stakeholders. And um, yeah, in Europe, we have approximately um, 26,000 employees and we have a network of more than 1,000 branches. So LKQ supplies over 100,000 independent workshops. And here we go local, of course, um, we find them in the cities, in the communities, and we are active in over 20 European countries. So our customers, the independent workshops, um, I will come back to this in a bit, um, what we do um, to support them in the transition, um, but also we want to support the end customers, the car drivers, and um, this is also why we are here. And let me quickly refer to our purpose. And our purpose is to enable and ensure safe, sustainable and affordable mobility for everyone in Europe. And we want to shape the future of the automotive aftermarket and support the transformation of the agency, especially looking at the trends. And we have heard it before, like electrification and digitalization. And um, we also aim to foster a circular economy. 
we have come out and we have grown of over 80 acquisitions in Europe. And you can imagine we had a very fragmented and diverse um, setup. And um, we went through an integration program, our one LKQ Europe program and um, streamlining and integrating our operation now also allows us um, to evolve as a company on an inclusive and just transition from a European perspective, but also from a regional, national and local, given our pan-European footprint. So going local in the transition. And yes, what we do is looking into practical solutions to ensure this inclusive and just transition while accelerating also the green digital and demographic transformation across all our operations. So let me focus quickly on the following areas that we also discussed in the leader hubs, a leaders um, hub uh, with CSR Europe. It's the workplace and people, the communities and social supply chain and the customers. So when we come to workplace and people, we focus, of course, on the health and safety and well-being of our teams. It is a top priority for our company, but also their development, their engagement and diversity and inclusion. Let me give you some specific examples on this. We have um, several initiatives that support our employees in the transition. And especially, as I had mentioned, the electrification and digitalization. And we are working on a strategy to create an inclusive corporate culture across all our operations in Europe. And um, moving into a new corporate identity, of course, also supports the employee identification and the engagement. We have started a leadership development program, so leading by example aligned to our values. And all of our colleagues within IKK Europe, they have the opportunity to particip participate in an e-learning platform um, and they can, they, can, um, yeah, they can get trained and they also get the opportunity and access to some well-being workshops. Additionally, we look into individual development plans and um, this helps, of course, our employees to progress in their career and in their developments. We have a big challenge given the fact that we have 18,000 frontline workers from our 26,000 employees. So what we are working on currently is a pan-European intranet solution, but also with an add-on tool that we can also reach our employees in the warehouses and our logistics operations to also engage with them and not only through their line managers. And um, we have an employee engagement survey, Your Voice Matters, that we have rolled out. And um, this helps us to identify actions to improve and to evolve as an employer of choice. And let me quickly mention, and you see the flag behind me, and um, this is what we have created for our internal awareness campaign um, when we um, started looking into support for our more than 900 Ukrainian colleagues from a company perspective, of course, we have supported and um, we are currently supporting 200 refugees from our colleagues and their families in our Central and Eastern European countries there, not only with accommodation and offering them a safe environment, but also um, with employment and giving them perspective if they want to stay. Um, but I'm very proud to say that um, we have also engaged with our employees and um, we have set up several bank accounts in, in diverse currencies and a GoFundMe page for our employees supported by an internal awareness campaign. And um, we have raised around 250,000 euros that have been donated um, to our uh, by our employees to be used by our Ukrainian colleagues. And the company will match this up to 1 million US dollars. And there is a steering committee that ensures the allocation of those funds. Let me quickly touch also communities and um, customers. So um, yeah, we are engaging um, in the communities we are operating in and our focus areas are their human and health services, technical and of course general education and a strong focus on the environment. We want to support and collaborate with the local communities um, in, the, in the topics of circular economy there. And also we encourage our own employees to become an integral part of the communities by engaging in community work. 
You can imagine as one of the world's largest aftermarket vehicle parts supplier and distributor, the supply chain management is core to our business. And um, this is why we are engaging with our partners and um, we ensure that labor standards and ethics are being followed. And we have started a process of developing a global supplier code of conduct. And um, yeah, this leads me to my last um, point, um, what I quickly wanted to address. Um, the customers. As I've mentioned, um, the customers are the independent workshops across Europe. And um, we try to um, yeah, prepare them also for this transition. And it's very small businesses, yeah, some, sometimes um, or very often also family owned businesses. And this is um, how we want to uh, um, support them in the transformation. We, yeah, look into skill development and reskilling, but as well as Jan mentioned earlier into business opportunities to support them that they will also be profitable um, in the future and at the same time sustainable. So we take responsibility for this affordable, safe and clean future mobility and we support our customers, the workshops with product services and training and um, yeah, I think there is a slogan that has been repeated several times also um, in our keynotes from our CEO, and it is the first to market in electrification because we want to become the go reference for our customers to prepare for this future transition. Mm -hmm. Other than that, yeah, we have the CQ um, Academy. It's a pan-European training program, and um, they can benefit from this, our workshop owners and employees, they learn um, new skills like high voltage trainings um, to work on hybrid and battery electric vehicles. So this prepares them what we call the workshop of the future, especially looking at the transition to um, yeah, um, in digitalization and electrification. And last but not least, the business and innovation and from our parent company coming from the recycling, um, we are looking into business opportunities, how we can apply circular economy principles um, to the business model, like um, repairing, remanufacturing and recycling of car parts, but also traction batteries. And this is how we want to contribute to this affordable, safe and clean individual mobility now and in the future and essentially create a circular economy there. So thank you very much um, that I could take part in this um, Webinar thank you. And thank you, Don. Thank you, Christian. Thank you. And thank you for all that intelligence, but also that emotional intelligence that you are putting personally in uh, designing this strategy for LKQ Europe. Um, and I think it's really interesting also with respect to what I believe uh, is also a very strong cross sector collaboration that we need to see happening between the automotives, but also the automotive aftermarket parts that you are representing. Um, I would like to ask Wilfried, how are you revisiting some of your fundamentals and your ser financial services, knowing that there is now so much high expectation from uh, citizens, but also from politicians and from regulators for companies to be more responsible and sustainable and contributing to a more just transition. So how a bank like BNP Paribas uh, and beyond, maybe you can also have some words, I can easily imagine how much you have been hit also by the current uh, Ukraine uh, war crisis. But overall, where do you put yourself um, as a company that is transforming itself? Hello, Jan. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation and also uh, uh, like the others, congratulations for this for this uh, event, uh, very timely uh, event. Um, I'd like to share with you uh, the, the bank's view. Uh, banks, uh, they um, uh, often uh, claim to play a key role in society. Uh, they allow people to participate in the economy. They um, uh, provide uh, financing for the real economy. They provide employment, they pay taxes, etc. But I would like to describe three moments of truth where banks have been able to demonstrate that there is indeed a role, a societal role for banks and even beyond the traditional role. The first moment of truth we had was the pandemic, yeah, where, and in particular when there was uh, the full lockdown, where 
there was really the uh, regarding staff, the question, can we uh, provide the possibility to work in all safety from a distance? If there was temporary no employment, keep them employed. The same for customers. We've been guaranteeing the availability uh, of the banking activities for customers, even if branches were closed. We've given customers, households, companies, oxygen when payments got difficult. And then maybe a third example, governments needed financing and we developed social bonds allowing governments to find attractive capital for financing the health activities. So there clearly the pandemic demonstrated the essential role of banks in society. That's my first moment mm -hmm. of truth. Mm -hmm. My second moment of truth is the international armed conflict in Ukraine, where indeed uh, we have uh, seen uh, with our bank uh, in, in, in uh, Ukraine, where we have uh, around 4,500 uh, collaborators. Uh, first of all, uh, finding safety for the uh, colleagues and families that have fled. And so our colleagues in Poland, for instance, accommodated uh, support for almost 1,000 uh, uh, of the colleagues and the families. But at the same time, the bank remained open. Uh, and I think that in terms of providing um, comfort for individuals and for the economy, that's crucial. And one step further, also the neighboring countries, uh, in terms of payment possibilities, uh, pr procedures were um, uh, facilitated to allow people that had to flee Ukraine to continue uh, to uh, pr uh, have access to the means uh, for ATMs and financing, etc., and easy opening of, uh, of accounts. So this is for me, uh, a, a, indeed, a, a second moment of truth. Have we been able to continue our operations while at the same time accommodating mm. uh, and the staff and the customers. The third moment of truth is what I would call the sustainability revolution. It's not a moment. It's going to take us up to 2050. But it must be clear that what we've seen with the pandemic and now also with the international armed conflict in Ukraine, that this is being accelerated. And this acceleration of the sustainability revolution forces financial institutions to look into how can we, in this uh, development, uh, reduce, avoid, prevent negative impact, and how can we, with our core activities, increase the positive impact of our banking activities, and in particular, with the social consequences. So um, to give you three, three examples, one is uh, financial institutions, they have to be sure that in a world that is, for instance, reorganizing its supply chains, yeah, mm -hmm. that companies, in particular in sensitive sectors, respect social and human rights in those supply chains. And if they don't accept certain criteria, we have to have the courage to stop financing. Secondly, we have, uh, despite the fact that now with the geopolitical situation, there's going to be probably a spike in use of fossil fuels, um, there is a trend to go to net zero. And this is a trend that is unstoppable. So therefore, not only as a bank and many banks with us have committed to become net zero by 2050. And we as a bank, we have already for oil and gas, for automotive and for power generation have already set 2025 uh, criteria. But the role of the bank will also be to accompany our customers in this transition. And we have created, for instance, for, for, for companies, uh, the low carbon transition group, a group of up to 250 bankers that will uh, accompany those sectors in a transition towards a uh, net zero economy by 2050. So that's my second example. The third example is to integrate the social aspect in your core activities. So to give you a few examples of that, it can be uh, targeting the most vulnerable, for instance, with supporting microfinance uh, uh, institutions. It can be supporting social entrepreneurs that find solutions for circular economy, energy transition, social issues with direct financing, equity financing, or uh, more technical creation of social impact bonds. That's a possibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You could look into um, the creation of um, energy efficient loans or soft mobility loans with cheaper, uh, with cheaper rates. You could look for dedicated access for people that don't have access or don't want access to bank but need the banking services like we've done with the the, the, the neobank uh, uh, nickel 
which has now already more than 2 million mm -hmm. clients. Mm -hmm. And maybe a last example is the uh, allowing companies and authorities to attract uh, capital maybe more easily with uh, social bonds or sustainability linked loans, where in fact, the money will be uh, invested in initiatives that are there for upskilling the staff in a sector that is going through uh, a whole uh, change due to the energy transition or where the rate of the loan is linked to certain criteria, such as, for instance, the diversity of the board. So these are three, let me say, moments of truth in which banks and, and we as a bank have uh, been able to go beyond our traditional role as a bank. And I think uh, it must be clear that sustainability, and it was said by an earlier speaker, sustainability must not stop now. We had thought with COVID that there would be a, a slowdown. It has not happened. There was an acceleration. Also now, with the international armed conflict in Ukraine, we should accelerate the agenda of sustainability. And uh, in particular, the financial sector, banking, asset managers, insurers should be ready to in, in integrate sustainability in their governance, in their strategy, in their risk, in their operations, uh, in terms of making really a difference. Because as our head of CSR always said, uh, the, the transition must be just. If there's no just transition, there will be no transition. So with that, I hope to have clarified a little bit the role banks can play. Thank you, Wilfried. Thank you very much. And when I listen to Christian and also then to you, um, I, I am, we are witnessing, witnessing day after day how you are bringing this acceleration into your companies. And I can easily imagine that you have to build your networks of experts, either internal and external, because to go the way you explain, uh, I can easily imagine that this is monster investments that you have to put into place to realize all these initiatives and this, these strategic uh, directions, uh, going beyond your traditional roles. So um, thank you for that. I also take uh, the point of uh, Christian, but also you, uh, Wilfried, uh, you are becoming strategic capacity builders to empower your suppliers, your customers to become sustainable, inclusive, and, and more uh, innovative with regard um, addressing this uh, energy transition, this um, digital transition, but also this demographic transition. So thank you very much for your contributions. And I would like to hear from Italy how this resonates within Sodaritas, uh, Elisa, how do companies in Italy embark uh, on this sustainable revolution that was pointed by Wilfried that is in a very fast acceleration? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ian. And uh, also thank you to CSR Europe to invite me in this webinar. I, I really believe that thanks to this kind of initiative, we can contribute first of all, to the Ukraine cause, and also to move some step forward towards a just transition in Europe and uh, all over the world, hopefully. I'm here representing my organization that is Fondazione Sodalitas. We are based in Italy, as you mentioned, and we are a national partner organization of CSR Europe since the, the very beginning. Since, uh, just to add a few words on my organization that maybe uh, not everyone uh, will already be familiar with. Uh, Fondazione Solaritax act as a partner for companies that consider sustainability a distinctive factor. And we help them to integrate it in their business strategies. Uh, we was established in 1995, thanks to the initiative, and it's important that, point of Asso Lombarda, that was the Italian largest employer association and a group of companies and volunteer managers. At the, at the time, we was the, the very first organization in Italy to promote corporate sustainability and social responsibility. Now we are mo more many actors on that, and I think it's quite positive. Uh, um, today, also my organization is joined more than 90 Italian leading companies on the topic of, uh, of sustainability. 
and how how we deal with the sustainability agenda of companies well we are committed to affirming the business leadership in achieving sustainable development and together with uh, with our corporate members we strongly believe in the power of building partnerships to be to to reach uh, the just uh, transition objectives so the the partnership in our perspective is a really key element to to reach the goals the the goals of the agenda 2030 and uh, all the goals of sustainability that companies have nobody can work alone on these uh, kind of uh, of topics through our initiative, we help companies to engage with their communities to generate so shared social value and to contribute to a more inclusive society. Across different projects and initiatives, we wanted to put the people at the center of sustainability strategies of companies. Our approach, our methodologies, is always a multi-stakeholder approach. So we would like to promote uh, initiative in co-designing this kind of initiative and collaboration between companies and the most relevant stakeholders. So we talk with the institution, with the third sectors and civil society, with schools, university and research centers, and of course with international networks. And uh, our main focus uh, is uh, all is always uh, social sustainability. So the focus on the S of the ESG matrix, uh, it's really at the core of our activities with the, with the objective of the reduction of inequalities among people. Our strategy to support the company's journey to just transition is composed by three pillars. So we work with companies on three main streams. The first is education and investment in young generation. The second one is a focus on people inside the companies with attention on employability, diversity and inclusion. And the third one is engagement in, in local communities to partnership with public actors and local actors as municipalities with the nonprofit organizations and, of course, with civil society. For example, just because we are here in support of Ukrainian, I want to mention the activity we did in support of Ukrainian people. Uh, we activate a channel of communication between companies and NGOs already working in the country to support the uh, creation of partnership among them through donation, in-kind contribution, and with objectives to, to support local communities. Many Italian companies, also those known directly operating in Ukraine, mm. supported various projects uh, coming from the NGOs uh, in the Ukrainian country to help uh, local communities, uh, uh, people, families, and children but also to support refugees uh, who came uh, in Italy. And we noticed a great commitment and solidarity. More than 25 among our member companies share directions in support to Ukraine, and 27 NGOs activate specific programs to help. And we collected all these results in our website and make it available to everybody just to take inspiration for further actions that can follow up. In, uh, in these weeks, uh, in, among Italian companies, we saw that the goal uh, 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions came on top on the business agenda. And many companies decided to act in support of this objective, mobilizing all their stakeholders to work together. We believe there's a long way to take together and our strategy to support companies to a just transition is to build this kind of multi-stakeholder partnership with, uh, with a clear focus on, uh, on social, on social and, uh, and future collaboration. So what we need to realize impactful collaboration. 
We need trust among all the partners. Okay, we need uh, to set up a common objective, a direction, and we need to set resources, uh, financial resources, as mentioned before by Ben Peparibas, and, uh, and human resources to get that objective. And uh, above all, I think we need a strong leadership to drive the change we need. We are seeing that today many companies are taking this leadership role and we are here to support them to announce their impact. And uh, we were very welcome. It's very welcome the initiative also of the Leaders Hub you presented at the beginning of the session for just transition at EU level. And uh, I'm thinking that uh, we, we need uh, to work all together also to deliver it uh, at the local level. And I think that uh, companies as, are ready to do that journey to, with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elisa. And it was good to also see that from how a network can bundle uh, the efforts of, of several companies. So thank you very much for that. I still have a question to Christian, also to you, Wilfried. Um, and Elisa, can you identify one area where you see that you are at the very beginning of, um, of addressing uh, situations where there are people, employees, or people in the communities that are left behind? So where is it that you can also identify some gaps where you say, I need inspiration, I need to have more expertise, stakeholder engagement to help us to solve this issue or that issue? Do you have some examples? Because I think it contributes also to the credibility of how you address sustainability, how you are building a strategy. It is not a 100% uh, uh, full-fledged uh, easy, easy thing. So can you identify what are some um, key challenges that, that you see you are under equipped for the moment? Christian? Yes, um, thank you, Jan. Of course, um, we are facing a lot of challenges and I try to quickly touch this in um, um, earlier with this integration program we have um, gone through, of course, we were talking about organizational design, but I think we are still, there's a big piece for us to do working on this inclusive corporate culture that we want to um, roll out across Europe and create for all our um, employees here in Europe. Um, coming from the over 80 acquisitions, of course, this is a very fragmented area and um, over 150 intellectual properties getting integrated in one company, you can imagine we are on different systems and, um, and there are several challenges and different priorities. Okay. So um, we are working hard to um, also engage with our executive team and our leadership team. So we have a leadership conference upcoming next week in Rotterdam. And I'm very happy because I've seen the presentation of our CEO, Nick Sacconi, um, today. And he has several slides there on our sustainability approach. So I think the awareness helps a lot. And I will host the workshop together with my colleague to um, yeah, to be able also to integrate um, the sustainability thinking and approach in each and every function and in the mm -hmm. operational model of the company. And that is what we hear a lot among companies that leadership, which is uh, elected as being a top, top one um, uh, enabler is often missing because there is fast change in leadership and you have to, con you have to school again and again. And so that is... Um, good that you have been pointing on that one. Wilfried, what is maybe yeah. the one area that you well, spot as a, a real uh, area for improvement? Well, I think, I think one of the challenges on a European level we're faced with is that um, this sustainability revolution we talk about is going to impact all companies. And while big companies have their teams and their specialists and they have, they're well aware mm. of what is happening, the risks and opportunities, I think more than 95% of the companies in Europe are SMEs 
And there is going to probably be a, a big challenge because they will be put under pressure by their uh, by their by the big companies they they supply to by the by the banks by uh, so I think SMEs is going to be a, 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 a true uh, battlefield to have just the resources and to, the the to, to to make them aware of the the risks but also the opportunities that are out there on the individual level I would like to give one other example that is digital exclusion because we see that with the pandemic the digitalization has helped uh, many people. But at the same time, uh, and this is coming from our teams in Belgium, um, with uh, with the the Fondation Roi Baudouin, they've calculated that 40% of the people cannot follow anymore because not only they don't have the tool or the connection, but mainly because they don't follow anymore with all the changes. And you need this for your access to tax, for a doctor reservation, for a school registration. So there we've created a... Um, uh, an ecosystem with governments, with social entrepreneurs, with uh, associations, with other companies, uh, which is called digital, and where we want to put this uh, this uh, leave no one behind in the digital revolution high on the agenda. It's called digital. How, it's spelled digital. Like... Uh, ah, yeah, digital ah, with ah, ah. all at the end. Uh, yeah. And you, if, if you look it up on uh, on. Uh, on internet and on LinkedIn, uh, it, there was a big event last week, bringing together all those stakeholders and making sure that we that we. Uh, and this means that, for instance, when a bank develops again a new update of a new easy banking app, that they take into account this group. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. And Lisa, in Italy, where are some of the black spots that you see uh, an answer and solutions and collaboration are needed? Well, uh, already mentioned, SMEs are SMEs, a great, yes. uh, great priority okay. because uh, we are made. <laughs> Our productive infrastructure is uh, mainly made of SMEs, uh, made, and we have uh, to work within the value, the different value chains, to to reach out those SMEs. And I think that uh, they need a support uh, in terms of uh, sustainability skills, because today we have the tools. Large companies as tools. Banks has ESG ratings. Um, we will have uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, also European directives that set up some points um, to deal with sustainability. But today in SMEs, there are no skills to adopt this kind of tools, to use this kind of uh, instruments that today maybe in large companies are more known. There are teams, uh, as mentioned before, there are resources, there are people working on that. In SMEs, no. You have to uh, provide skills within the SMEs to help mm. them in joining this uh, revolution. Absolutely. And thank you for that. And I think this can be part of a strong outcome of this discussion. There is, and we call that in Cities Europe, a duty not only to care, but a duty to collaborate, especially between buyers and suppliers. We even know very interesting initiatives. It's called responsible sourcing or solidarity sourcing. It was um, innovated or incubated with L'Oréal and now many more companies. Uh, there's a group of companies in the OECD and the group called Business for Inclusive Growth that are now using uh, processes, systems and methodologies on how to conduct responsible sourcing between buyers and suppliers. And at CISA Europe, we are also extremely uh, pushing the EU not only to come with regulation, but with strong accompanying measures. Um, Stefan and, 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 and colleagues went to uh, Congo and South Africa, and it's quite clear if we do not help collaboration locally to address the root causes of, is it poverty or of human rights, bad conditions, uh, we will end with clean sheets and many more audits, but that is not going to enhance the livelihoods um, of farmers or uh, miners and, and many more workers. So great to have that message. I also link that to the message from Audrey. Do it with the local authorities. 
do it with the regional authorities. And this tells me that companies have also uh, today through a new regulation, this country by country um, reporting on tax. Uh, we cannot be champions on sustainability or leaders on sustainability. And at the same time, uh, Olympic champions on tax evasion. It cannot continue. Uh, we need to have also the local authorities and the regions being equipped for, uh, is it the basics, uh, quality education services, canteens, uh, health and so forth. So that is an element that we also bring into uh, this uh, uh, so-called sustainable uh, sustainability revolution mentioned by uh, Wilfried. I will stop it here and I would like um, to ask if uh, Marina, you can take uh, over. We are both doing a few conclusions, but Chris did already quite uh, strong um, uh, conclusions at the beginning of the session, which is always very good. But uh, please, Marina, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jan. Uh, and first of all, uh, I would like to thank you, teams of uh, Globescan and CSI Europe, and uh, for this fantastic web webathon. And uh, uh, sure, I would like to thank uh, Ukrainian team of CSI Ukraine and our technical team, designers, uh, translators. Thanks a lot, guys. You you are you are great uh, because. Um, now it was quite uh, not calm night in Kyiv, but you did your best. Thank you. Thank you to all 24 partners and sponsors who united to support Ukraine. And thanks to all people who made donations. And I just know that there is somebody who did quite generous donation via the BroUA. So please, uh, I invite you to... Um, make a donation and uh, we will continue fundraising campaign by the end of July. And there are some insights uh, from this webathon on my side. First, there is a war in against Ukraine. And please do not call it a conflict. It's not a conflict, it's mm -hmm. a devastating mm -hmm. and bloody war. Mm -hmm. And But our companies and our organizations are functioning so invite us in the project, include our SMEs in uh, your supply chain. You will help Ukraine a lot. Also, invest in Ukraine through development of new projects. Ukraine will be a great place for creative industries, for IT, for internship and entrepreneurship, and for new businesses, including businesses on sustainability issues. So come to Ukraine, come to Western Ukraine. And also Ukrainian experience is critical and important for the world now. Uh, and uh, for example, leadership lessons. Now our both political and businesses one, just now our top managers can tell and share their experience how to lead people in the times of uncertainty. Also resilience lessons. Our companies now know what to do in times of uncertainty, how to save teams and help people. And also volunteering lessons. Practically every Ukrainian is volunteering now. So invite us to speak and share our experience about this. And I hope quite soon we could add to this list one more thing that Ukraine can show how to use sustainability and environmental principles in rebuilding the country and cities. Uh, for this, we need to wait a bit. We need to wait for our victory. And here we need your support uh, in many things. Buy Ukrainian, be mentor for Ukrainians, visit Ukraine, support civil society and seven organizations we selected for this webathon, but not only this organization, you can support many, many other civil society organizations, but please support local organizations, include Ukrainian companies in your supply chain. So please stand with us as now Ukrainian army and Ukrainians stand for Europe and for the world. Thank you. Nina, thank you very much. Um, and we welcome these words. We welcome um, the overall initiative of these 24 hours that 
needs now to continue. Um, I also would like, of course, to extend uh, our gratitude to the colleagues here at CISA Europe, Hannah, Stefan, Daria, and many more that have um, allowed us to play this collaboration with Globescan and with you. We are very proud to be your partners. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you also because you have been helping a lot of us, including myself, to overcome um, uh, a position where we were, where we are too often petrified by the images of destruction and of, of the killings. Um, I have been witnessing uh, some of these sessions and I was, and I am now able to put a human face to so many fighters. Is it people from business or in civil society? Was it also your deputy minister of economy? We are all one uh, in, in that fight. So my final uh, comment or conclusion is to ask, please, all of you, share, share the link to this website uh, and including the link to make uh, donations. Share it with your teams, share it with your families and communities. I was able to go home yesterday and to tell my wife, I have been participating to this action today. And she was able to connect also these terrible images that we have on the news all days to uh, link with people I have met on the website, which are working in these uh, NGOs that are about healing and about reconstructing the se um, severe damages in, in your country. So thank you very much for that, because now we can continue. And we know that also through our contributions and donations, the people I've met on the website, they are the hands and the feet for us to act locally. And that is um, giving hope, uh, much more than if you stay passive and being petrified. We have to overcome that uh, first kind of uh, attitude. So thank you very much for that. Thank you to all of you. And I really would like maybe to ask Chris, uh, who has still a little bit of voice, to give us the very uh, final closing uh, conclusion, or it's not a conclusion, maybe a next step a conclusion um, uh, as from now on. Chris. Thank you so much, John, and thank you for the, the panel and the wonderful discussion, and thank you, Marina, again, for that uh, great articulation of, of um, how we take lessons from Ukraine and apply them forward everywhere and, and on the sustainable development journey and, and do it in a way that um, is by design on the rebuilding the country as a showcase for how sustainability can, can um, create that better future that we're all after. So just to say what a whirlwind, um, it's an extraordinary set of conversations, an extraordinary set of partners. I'll just rattle them off very quickly just to showcase the, the breadth. We had three BL Media, ACATU Institute from Brazil, Octus ESG from India, B Lab, BBMG, BSR, the Business Council for the United Nations, Business Fights Poverty, Business Leaders Forum, CBSR of Canada, CSR Europe, of course, CSR Ukraine, Elevates out of Asia, Forum for the Future, uh, Green Biz, uh, GRI, Mala out of Israel, Net Positive, uh, Rethink Asia, Sustainable Brands Japan, Sustainable Brands Thailand. Uh, sustainability connect out of Singapore and WWF so it just shows again how quickly and how deep and distributed the sustainability community is across the world and, and I'm very proud to be a part of that and, and it's a remarkable um, remarkable uh, expression of how quickly we can move when we, we need to and while it's one small thing that we've done here together as you say Jan, it's, it, um, it, it feels right and, and the right approach for us to come together and also to I think reassess where we are on this 35 year journey. Um, you know, in 1987 is when Madam Brentland pum published Our Common Future, where the, the term sustainable development was created. And we have a deep and long history and we can see the, the momentum moving around this. So the inevitability and the irresistibility of sustainability is becoming clearer to all of us. So we've got to fight through it and, and, uh, and be strong. And after 24 hours and 30 <laughs> minutes, maybe we give each other all five minutes back and um, want to thank everyone who participated and, and finally Slava Ukraini. Thank you so much. Heroem Slava. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for, for everything. Chris, Jan, thank you. Thank you for participation and for being with us. Yeah.